Hello, Penguinauts! Sign the Beardy Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance. We have a bit of a housekeeping episode today. Lots of building and maintaining infrastructure and keeping crew happy and topping up life support and the like. So that gives me a bit of more of an opportunity to talk about things that I find interesting. Well, maybe a little bit about Kerbal Rising as well. A lot of people have been asking about that. Just so you know, the mission that we're sending here is the Harpy. We're sending Katrina Kerman all the way over to Talos 1 because our crew on Talos 1, they need to be rotated, okay? Because they are very sick of being up there for so long. This is a feature of USI life support, which I really do like. There is a limit to how long a Kerbal can stay on board a space station. And if you add habitation modules to that space station, that increases that limit. But if you put more and more Kerbals up there, then it's gonna get more and more cozy, and then that limit will go down. So our scientists and our pilots on Talos 1 are pretty much sick of each other at this point. So we need to go retrieve them, bring them back home for a bit of R and R. So, the things I want to talk about. First of all, Falcon Heavy launched. I obviously am a bit late on the <laughs> this bandwagon here. I, I went on a cadet camp to Folkestone, which was very exhausting, uh, but very, very fun. Which is why I've just been sort of had scheduled Hearts of Iron 4 videos going up. That's why there hasn't been any KSP over the past week or so. But yeah, Falcon Heavy. Isn't that amazing? It all worked, and Elon Musk just has an amazing sense of humor. Starman in a red Tesla Roadster, which is pretty funky. I had one of my one of my more cynical friends say he only sent it to space because the Tesla Roadster is a horrendous car. So, you know, take that how you will. But it just put a few things in perspective for me, because I read a report, a very scathing report by the Mars Society, on NASA these days. What is NASA doing these days? You ask the bog standard person, they don't know, because they're not really doing anything. They've got plans for the SLS, the Space Launch System, which is intended to sort of replace the shuttle. They've put $18 billion into the development of that. But with the Falcon Heavy launching, do we actually need it anymore? Because the Space Launch System is not reusable. It can launch 130 tons into low Earth orbit, which is a lot. I mean, that is the most powerful rocket ever built by humanity. Ever. That's more powerful than the Saturn V. However, it costs one billion dollars per launch, and it's not reusable at all. No part of it is, is reusable, apart from, I guess, the capsule. But even then, I don't think they're even planning to reuse that. So, why would you not just use the Falcon Heavy, which costs $90 million, that's not accounting for reusability, and it can launch just shy of half that payload. I think it's 50, no, 64 tons into low Earth orbit, the Falcon Heavy. Why would you not just use two launches of the Falcon Heavy, instead of the Space Launch System? It's, yeah. And what are NASA planning to use the Space Launch System for? Are they planning to send people to Mars? No. And this was the, this was the focus of the report uh, by the Mars Society. Are NASA actually planning to go to Mars? No, they're not. And this kind of... It's like a curtain's been lifted for me because I've always been brought up to think NASA, you know, NASA, they are at the cutting edge of technology. They are pioneers. They're the people pushing humanity forward. You know, if you want to say, oh, someone's going to do really well in life, going to be a um, you know, famous uh, scientist, and you say, ah, they're going to go work for NASA. That's always the standard. But are NASA actually pioneers anymore? They're not. They're just a government agency just buried in bureaucracy. The space shuttle was not the most efficient or the cheapest way to get things into orbit, but what did it do? It created the most jobs. NASA don't have a big enough budget to do anything particularly ambitious, and as such, they just get their 18 billion dollars, however, however, I don't know what their budget is, but they get their money every year, and they just need to spend that money for the sake of having that money. There's no focus, they're just doing things to spend money and their new plans which they've unveiled for the deep space gateway which is a space station around the moon they've justified it by saying oh you know it's like it's like a, a stop like a service station on the way to mars and future missions out into the solar system question do we actually need that 
it is much more efficient just to go straight to Mars. If you stop at the moon, think about it, you've got to get into orbit around the moon and rendezvous, that costs a lot more fuel. So it's actually utterly pointless for going to Mars. We're not really, we don't have any plans for future missions to the moon. And even then, you can just send things straight to the moon. You don't need a space station. It is an utterly pointless thing. Um, I'll put this on hold for a second. As you can see, we, we finally got our harpy back to solitude with all of our crew inside. And we're finally doing our circularization burn with our Sentinel space probe, which of course has the infrared camera, which is going to map asteroids for us. So it's finally got into its desired orbit and we're just circularizing. And now it's going to stay there to map some asteroids, which could potentially threaten solitude. Anyway, back to my, my rant about NASA. The Deep Space Gateway has essentially no purpose. And... Yeah, it's, it's, it's no purpose, and the, the Space Launch System has been designed. The Space Launch System, essentially a, a pointless rocket, now we have the Falcon Heavy, has been designed to create the Deep Space Gateway, which is pretty much a pointless space station. And it's all just for the sake of spending money to give people jobs... And that's it. It's not pushing forward the the cusp of human space exploration. It's just they're just utterly just superfluous. And I don't know. I know this is a very cynical view to take. It is. It is a very cynical view. And I'll get onto the mission that we're launching right now. I, I just felt I needed to talk about this. Because it's really interesting. That Really, the people who landed men on the moon, they're not the people really driving the ship anymore. It's pioneers like Elon Musk, and it kind of worries me to think that... Well, obviously, it's very inspiring, but without people like Elon Musk, we wouldn't do anything. Why is it that a single person can have more drive, more vision than than a government agency, which should be an entire nation's uh, efforts, you know, hopes and dreams? I just find that... just find that fascinating anyway let me know your thoughts in the comments guys um obviously as i said nasa they still I, i'm not blaming the people at nasa what whatsoever okay they are hamstrung by a lack of political will or interest um and they still do amazing things new horizons they've got plans for a nuclear helicopter to titan all sorts of amazing things i'm not saying nasa is a useless agency and i'm just saying when it comes to manned exploration it is questionable what they're doing and the mars society report just said they're just doing brand there's no plan there's no a program as such there is no detailed thing okay we're gonna do this 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 and this and by this year we're gonna do this it's just oh look a uh, uh, space station now uh, look there's this oh look at that one now uh, look at that one now uh, yeah anyway as i said let me know what you think on to the mission that we are actually doing right now so we have a very lucrative contract uh, about four hundred fifty thousand funds to expand Hyperion, which of course is our surface base on Nemesis. So what we're doing is we're sending uh, an, a lovely hydroponics module, as you can see there. This is a much lighter spacecraft than uh, than the core module, because you don't have to put all the fuel on it. So we use the same launch system as last time, and this time we actually have more than enough fuel to get out to Nemesis. Very similar design to the core of the Hyperion uh, base, except this one has got wheels, because of course we have to actually dock it to Hyperion and as such we need to be able to maneuver it on the surface so it's got some very small wheels. Thankfully the gravity on Nemesis isn't too high so we can get away with using small wheels but uh, we will need to research some slightly larger uh, and some slightly tougher wheels later down the line. I believe your colonization has got a lot of actual mobile base parts so that should make things a little bit more interesting. At the moment we're just sort of making do with the parts that we have. But as you can see uh, we've got a hydroponics module which means we'll take a lot of the strain off of the life support system because the base module was heavy enough I didn't have room for any kind of recyclers or anything they're actually running low on life support we're also taking uh, an extra pilot because the contract that we have for some reason required us to have two pilots on station and we're also taking two scientists to finally make use of that science lab because since we've circulated uh, the scientists off of Talos 1 we actually have scientists spare to send to Nemesis. Uh, they're actually level 1 scientists but just sending them to Nemesis and then leveling them up in the science lab will actually get them to level 2 so they can get quite a bit of research done on the surface here. 
As you see, we land surprisingly without breaking any wheels. We also have an engineer, I should mention. Ben Kerman is here uh, to repair stuff because I thought when I landed, I was almost certain I was going to break the wheels, but surprisingly we didn't. And after a short couple of kilometer trek, we get over to Hyperion. The brakes aren't particularly effective in 0.2 Gs, so it takes quite a while for us to slow down, but we just do a circle around the base and then we get round in front of it. As you can see, we've got one of those uh, docking adapters because the only docking port on Hyperion is at the front underneath that B9 overview cockpit. So we have actually got some better place docking ports now on the uh, on this second module, one's on the side, so we don't just have a bunch of modules lined up and attached together. It isn't beautiful, but hey, you know, it's good enough for what it is. It doesn't line up perfectly, so what we have to do after a bit of wiggling about is we deactivate the front engines and then we just lift the rear of the, uh, the base using those rear engines. Just do it very carefully, and sure enough, we dock to the base. Look at that! Hyperion has expanded. It is a bit sort of knocked together, isn't it? But hey, it's designed for function, not for form, so I think it looks alright. We get our massive rewards for our contract. We actually get a world first for creating the world's first base on Nemesis. However, that reward is uh, significantly reduced by our current strategy because we have wasteland probes going on at the moment. So we pledged our space program to probes around wasteland, so we significantly reduce our world first um, money for every other body in the solar system, but hey, that isn't too much of a problem. And now all we have to do is go through all of the scientific instruments on the station and put a bunch of data into the science lab for our scientists to research. What we also do is we activate our habitats and we activate our new farm. So what that's going to do is recycle the mulch produced by our kerbals and a bit of fertilizer and we're going to grow some food. It's not perfect, it's not going to make it self-sufficient, but hey, uh, we're essentially just testing it because I'm entirely new to USI life support, so we're going to take things one step at a time. Of course, we still have that very expensive first stage sitting in orbit around Solitude. It was powerful enough to get us up into orbit. It's essentially a, a single stage to orbit, which I find quite interesting. And now we need to return it to the ground because, of course, it has uh, a <laughs> number of those very, 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 very expensive vector engines, although they, of course, are very, very good as well. We keep two activated uh, with their gimbal to try and maintain control of the rocket, and we have a bit more fuel for descent this time. Last time we didn't include anywhere near enough, so we have a bit more which allows us to slow down. We have a more shallow uh, descent trajectory too, so we don't lose any engines, thankfully. A lot of people have told me that my air brakes are the wrong way around. Um... I think it looks better like this, much, much better. It looks more rocket-like. Um, I think people are thinking more in the terms of planes. It, for a plane, if you want an air brake, the air brake does open forward, so you're, you're not... So you're pushing it open against the, the rush of air, uh, so you have much better control over it, but it's it's aerodynamic, so it's pointing forward. I wanted them this way, so that they are they look aerodynamic while you're launching upwards, but then when you're going back into the atmosphere, you're just going to open them fully anyway. So I think it looks much better to have the air brakes pointed the way they are. We also turn them into sort of semi-control surfaces as we descend, because after we run out of fuel, we just use them to maneuver the rocket so that we can slow ourselves down and land gently on our parachutes. And now we have to send yet another mission, actually, out to Hyperion. Because that, although we did just expand the base, it is still not in working order. Uh, the Kerbals that are currently on the base used a lot of their supplies, and that uh, module, the hydroponics module, didn't actually bring enough supplies up. So we need to send up a, a bunch more supplies, a bunch more life support. We also need to take out one of the Kerbals on station, um, a medic who has become homesick, because really there isn't a lot of living space on Hyperion, I'm not going to lie. Uh, we also want to take our two pilots off the station because we don't need Ted and our other Kerbal. I've forgotten the name of the pilot. I think it's... Sh no, it's not Sheldon. Anyway, we've got another. We've got two pilots up there. We needed them there for the contract, but now they're there. We don't really need them, so we're going to bring them back home. So that's the purpose of this spacecraft. We're replacing the medic we have on station, who is currently homesick, with the Kerbal that we have on this spacecraft, and then we're going to take that Kerbal and our two pilots back home. We're also taking a bunch of Kerbal inventory and Kerbal attachment system parts, because you never know. It's a surface base, things are going to go wrong. We've got a bunch of tools, we've got a bunch of pipe endpoints, ground pylons, just things that might be useful for future operations. We get 100,000 uh, funds, actually, every time we launch something. 100,000 100, funds every time we launch uh, something of significant weight into orbit with our super heavy launches strategy, which is particularly nice. We didn't get it on that one, but on the last launch, um, I think we actually made a profit from launching the rocket, since almost at least. Because 
Oh, we reused the first stage, and we got a huge amount of money for getting that first stage up into orbit. So, yeah, launch costs aren't really a problem with our space program anymore. Clearly, um, clearly, the public interest in the space program has uh, has begun to peak now that we've become a lot more successful. I don't know. I don't know how to explain that strategy, getting a huge amount of money each time you launch something of a specific weight into orbit. Um, maybe it's just government grants or something. I don't know. <laughs> But as you can see, we are getting our spacecraft into orbit of Nemesis. So it's going to head down to the surface. We're actually going to leave the lower half of it on the surface. That's the bit with uh, a bit of fuel, a bunch of life support, and all of our Kerbal inventory systems uh, supplies. And that's going to be attached to the base by, uh, via a pipe. And then we've got another stage, uh, which is going to decouple, and that's going to launch back to Solitude with the Kerbals inside. All we have to do is orbit around for a little bit to make sure the base is below us. Thankfully, being on a, an equ actual, uh, equatorial latitude, it's quite easy to actually travel to it. So no matter what inclination we're in, eventually we will pass over the base, which certainly reduces the Delta V requirements while actually heading out to it. Talos 1 is a bit of a pain to rendezvous with. Thankfully, obviously, it's a space station. Um, but yeah, you can really get have to do some very expensive inclination change maneuvers to get into... Uh, to get an intersect with Talos 1 around Guardian. It's kind of ironic that I was talking about how useless uh, the NASA built moon station is going to be. And a lot of this series has revolved around my moon station. But hey, my moon station has actually got a lot of purpose. And we don't actually have a station around Solitude, whereas obviously NASA have got the International Space Station. Anyway, coming down, we do actually run out of fuel at the last second. And as such, uh, yeah, we land a little hard and break our engine but thankfully after bouncing a few times we do manage to set the spacecraft down and just break one of the solar panels unfortunately we can't actually move now but thankfully the base has actually got wheels on it only the second module though so what we have to do is we have to retract the landing legs on the main module of hyperion and then we have to use the rear engines to just very gently lift that end of the station off of the ground and then we can use the wheels on the second module to move us forward very very carefully and very slowly so this is a bit awkward this base wasn't really designed to be moved it was just the second module needed to be maneuvered a little bit to actually dock it but uh, sure enough it works relatively well we landed close enough that uh, it isn't too much of a problem look at all the lights on Hyperion we probably should get a shot of it during the night time on Nemesis I think with all the lights and spotlights and all that it, it might look quite striking I don't know but anyway we get ourselves heading over we have to get quite close because we need to connect the two spacecraft with some Kerbal attachment system pipes and those don't stretch particularly far but sure enough we draw alongside and we get out Ben Kerman who is our resident engineer and he's gonna head over he checks the first box uh, that one's actually empty because I didn't realize that Kerbal inventory system didn't work with symmetry I assumed it would put stuff in both boxes but it didn't, but hey. We get ourselves out an electric screwdriver and one of our pipe endpoints. And after I quickly figure out how to actually use Kerbal <laughs> Attachment System, uh, we attach it to Hyperion. Then all we have to do is link that pipe over to our spacecraft. Just so you know, this spacecraft, I believe, is called the Griff uh, something... It's, it's, front half of it is Hippogriff, that's it, there you go, front half of it is an eagle, back half is a horse, it's Hippogriff. Uh, I'm just naming them after winged mythological creatures now. But sure enough, now we have all the life support we need to keep this station operational for about a year or so. We transfer our crew that need to head home into the Hippogriff, and we will send them home in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching everyone, I do hope you have enjoyed, and I will see you all next time.